Excellent. Okay. Um, first, uh, thank you everyone for your patience and for being muted. Um, I am an absolute Luddite. I say this with pride. I don't know anything about anything. Um, I'm very much reliant on my colleague Kanvi here. So um, thank you for, for carrying this. Um, but my name is Huda, Huda Khaira. I am an artist researcher and, but more importantly for me anyway, I'm a black woman from South London. And I, I say that because this shapes how I understand the political and my, um, the, the, the vantage point by which I've come to sort of this, this analysis and this kind of taking um, of Oliver Morris' life. Um, I uh, worked on, the, the, how I came into this project is that Consent had invited me to take part in um, sharing an, a, a seminar, a class with, with young people, sixth formers, um, addressing um, the sort of the new changes in the syllabus about British, so-called British um, values and um, trying to um, proffer alternatives to the narrative that our current government are seeking to share about what it is to be from this country and what this country means and what this country means to young people, specifically young people from uh, racialized minority um, communities. I say that to emphasize that when we're talking about race, and, and I, hope that, I hope that's just implicitly understood, but if it's not, it's really important that we make it explicit. I have my own story about what I am, where I'm from. There are structures in place, institutionalized, but also interpersonal. There, there's a whole dynamic by, way, by which meaning is made, including through language, that um, positions people. And so thinking about race, not as this um, sort of objective, um, meaning but as a as a as a a, a a way of sense meaning um thinking of of race and racism not as acts like each other so i can speak about race and not be racist but rather implicitly race operates to demarcate value to demarcate status and that is a function of capital like that's that is that is how we understand capital and capitalism I'm going to be talking about Olive Morris and hopefully that will elucidate, that will explain what I'm speaking about more um, uh, uh, clearly. But um, when we talk about anti-racism, we're not talking about something that's outside of critiques of global capital. It's not something that needs to be added on to. Um, it's that, if anything, if you can speak about capital and capitalism without speaking about race, then, then which most of the time actually does happen, um, that's the issue. Maybe you don't understand what capitalism is about. Um, for me, and my analysis and my reading of Olive Morris, that 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 tension is implicit. It's 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 the the bedrock foundation um, of where I'm going with this. Um, so anyway, like I said, I was involved in that project with Consented, and um, Olive Morris is someone who I've lived with my whole life. Um, literally, <laughs> and um, in doing this research about her, um, about her life, her political activism, it really helped verbalize and sort of give real life examples of how black women in this country have, have organized politically and how that um, political organization, uh, organizing has been um, not even left out of narrative, or political narrative of, of, of the state in general, of what it is to be British anyway, all that kind of stuff, but even sort of alternative leftist radical um, narratives of, of, of political organizing. But because actually the political, the framework, the intellectual framework, the political framework by which we understand organizing um, doesn't have a register to think about the, the specific ways that um, racism, Global capital impacts the body politic of those that are a gendered female. So understanding gender not as a given, but as also a structure of power, and gen and racialized as black. Again, understanding that. Um, so yeah, I've, I've kind of come up with some some big things. So it's time to back up the beef. Um, as I said, um, I've lived with Olive Morris a whole life, but in in ways that's very in keeping with um, sort of the the neoliberal co-optation of 
radical struggle, specifically black women's um, uh, radical struggle. I'm, I'm gonna share my screen and you're gonna see a photo um, of the former housing office in Lambeth. So if you guys can see that, let me make the screen big, big. Um, and now you'll just hear my distended voice as if this isn't already very um, surreal. Um, the, um, so as I said, like that, oh yeah, that was the, that this building actually is now defunct, but the Olive Morris is the name given to the housing office in Lambeth, um, where I'm from. Uh, my parents came to the UK as refugees in the 80s and for the first eight years we were had sort of while we were contesting our immigration status we came um, as, as refugees and trying to get passports and things like that back in the day when you could still have access to public resources we were in temporary accommodation in lots of places throughout Lambeth and later in Croydon because and all of this is political because of um, how uh, kind of refiguring the Lambeth was kind of refiguring its borough, changing its, its population dynamics um, in the aftermath of the Brixton riots and the general political sort of um, upheavals that were happening in the 80s uh, in, in response to demands by um, racialized communities, um, black um, people, people of African uh, Caribbean diaspora specifically in my borough sort of being one of the largest um, so-called minorities um, uh, sort of and so we were sort of like rushing or we would go to Olive Morris house you know my mom with all these little babies in the pram trying to get housing and um, yeah her name was not something that was some uh, sort of a positive name um, later as I, I um, as I sort of started doing more local research and, and, and trying to understand uh, just generally my area where I'm from. And um, I, I came across um, a wonderful book called uh, The Heart of the Race, Black Women um, Lives in Britain. I've got it next to me here. And this was um, a sociological text written, um, co co written by Beverly Bryant, uh, Stella Dadzi, and um, Susan and uh, Scarf, Scaife, who were. Um, they themselves friends and colleagues of Olive Morris in the UK Black Panther movement and later in the sort of the, the different groups that kind of fed from, from the UK Black Panther movement like um, uh, a Brixton, a Black Women's Group and OAD which I'll, I'll go into more and they sort of devoted a whole chapter on their, on their dear friend, on their colleague and her activism, her housing activism specifically um, and so when we talk about Olive Morris and you'll be like, afterwards you'll be like, wow, Lambeth, what a slick move to sort of like, uh, which is what neoliberalism does, which is to um, the word co-opt and, and, and return um, ideas, concepts, people that actually have the ability to disrupt and um, delegitimize your, your source of power. Um, so that that was my relationship with with her. Um, to, to close off that that story about our housing situation, um, Lambeth never did house us in the end. Um, what I'm I'm living, I have my family. We live in a house that is run by a housing cooperative. Um, the, the housing cooperative that we first uh, lived with, that that sort of housed us after that kind of extended period of of houselessness, was um, presentation. And that was an organization that was created specifically in the, um, to address uh, racial discrimination um, in, in housing allocation of, um, for, for people from, from minority, uh, racialized minority communities. Um, and so I live in Lambeth, but it's not a, a council property. And uh, that was a community-led initiative. Housing associations have been a community-led responses to the issue of houselessness and the way that it impacts um, racialized communities specifically. Um, and being able to politicize that issue, understanding that there isn't a narrative of, oh, there's just so many immigrants in this country and we've got such little housing stock and the land is limited, so we can't, it's kind of Malthusian um, economic discourse that pervades about um, why is it there's so many people that are, have housing insecurity 
why it's so expensive for people to not just even own property, even to rent, and understand and and uh, understanding that actually this is not just a, um, a function of supply and demand, but this is a way that um, supply supply discourse is is rooted in. Well, we'll go into this more uh, towards the end, but knowing that um, who isn't allocated housing and how even the state in its most benevolent form, such as so the concept of, of social housing, requires race and raciality for, for sense-making. Um, so I'm gonna stop screen share and speak more about that. Um, so as I said, Olive Morris, um, this is a real life person. Her fan, she's from um, Jamaica and grew up um, until the age of nine there in um, St. Catherine's Parish. Um, and her family, her parents came to the UK when she was very young. So she grew up with her, her, um, her grandparents as, as sort of the experience of many um, immigrant children. And her parents, uh, they, they, they were able to re reunite the family in the UK, in London, in Battersea of all places, um, uh, after she was nine years old. Um, Olive Morris went to high school here in the UK. Um, and she went to uh, Lavender Hill Girls in Battersea, and then later Tulse Hill Secondary School, um, which is kind of like more Brixton side of SW2. Um, her sort of coming to, um, let me show you this beautiful picture of her. Um, her coming to sort of political, her, there's a story that um, that's sort of often spoken about her coming into political um, um, awareness as it were, if that's to sort of, if that's still not a sort of a state term, I'm talking about sort of consciousness raising and awareness, was um, a kind of a, an incident that I hope if we can decompact, can speak a little bit about the difficult place that um, people, uh, gendered, female, racialized as black have in, uh, in sort of in sense making, and maybe we can help us think about um, the kind of specific political demands um, that those experiences raise and the way that those demands are very difficult to articulate in kind of the historical materialist kind of, I'm, I'm going to say that because I think explicitly the kind of discourse that's being had here in Consented is kind of rooted in leftist historical materialist um, analysis of capital and everything that stems from from that. Um, and as yeah, so hopefully when we get into that story, we can think about how this is this is a contested space. Um, the story goes that um, Olive Morris, um, as a 17 year old, was walking down the street and came upon a for all um, in a in a venue in Brixton. It's no longer um, open. Desmond Hip Hop. A hip, sorry, hip uh, record store on Atlantic Road it was sort of a popular venue where people would hear records of the day from um, from the US and the Caribbean, um, sort of black black music from the US and the Caribbean, uh, bebop and and um, or sort of like Motown records and things like that. And it was a, a popular venue for people who love that type of music, and specifically for. Um, for people from the African and uh, Caribbean diaspora that were in London at the time. Um, it also had sort of a, an eating venue there. Um, a Nigerian diplomat by the name of uh, Clement Gomwalk was um, in that area. His family were inside, his wife and children were sort of like enjoying the records and uh, eating in the restaurant. And he himself, um, because he was a sort of a person from an affluent background and was a, as a, a diplomat, was a very expensive car that was parked outside the record, uh, the record store. Um, the police came upon him and asked him for his particulars to which he um, provided his diplomatic immunity and whatnot. Um, and yet he was harassed and accosted. Young people 
it, as the story goes, the young people in the record store and around sort of uh, Atlantic Road and just the area came about and circled the police and and um, sort of addressed the reason that you know this is kind of an everyday part and parcel of Black life that they were being accosted and trying to come to the aid of of uh, Mr. Gumwalk. Um, it was reported now. This is where I think it's really interesting. So. Olive says she was walking and she came upon the um, the furore and was 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 attacked by the police, was beaten and taken to the police station along with a, a general number of, of young young people that had come to the aid of um, Mr. Gomwalk, um, Clement Gomwalk. Um, it was reported in the ne the papers afterwards that she valiantly came to the aid of. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Gomwalk and, and sort of came between him and a baton. And in, in that sort of a furore, she received her injuries. Um, I always, I remember reading this, like, and this is kind of the official narrative as well that Lambeth shares, um, and I'll speak about the kind of the ways that, that um, Olive Morris is now being memorialized. But yeah, like imagine 17 year old girl is gonna come like sort of violently in defense and this kind of physicality um, between her and, and a, a grown up person. The, the fact that Olive was only 17, I think oftentimes gets neglected in these kind of narratives. Um, and uh, when Olive speaks about the harassment that she faced from the police afterwards, that disarticulation between her being a young woman uh, and her actual experiences that arguably are not ones that um the stereotype or the sort of visioning of what what happens to women or what the kind of things that uh, take place against women in these um political spaces i think really kind of gets to something that could be the the sui generis this I mean, yeah i'm going to say that's a very specific uh unique space that black women occupy in the political imaginary so the police come and they arrest them all she goes to prison, she goes into to, 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 to in custody. But the whole time, the police are questioning her gender. I'm going to show you a photo of Olive, um, just to sort of like really make this clear of the, the um, yeah, the kind of the, the things that we take as every day, I think often like uh, get, don't get seen as, as political, but actually are reflected as something that is deeply political. Um, she was a sort of she's not just just an average height woman um, had dark hair dark skin and the police um, constantly uh, sort of used this opportunity to question her uh, her her gender threatened to have her um, placed in um, custody in in um, in a male in a male side of the prison. Um, had um, they asked her to, they, they said that in order for her to be, um, they needed her to prove that she was a woman and therefore they um, uh, required her to strip search, uh, be, to be sort of, to, to physically examine her, um, her, her body to prove that she was a woman. She's done, she narrate, Olive later narrates this awful ordeal um, in order to highlight the, the shocking ways that the police um, operate the kind of the generalized police violence that gets um, um, that 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 young people and specifically her uh, experience. But I think that this kind of body politic, um, the way that that female um, femaleness is not recognized in um, oftentimes not recognized in, in women uh, uh, who sort of by all like I use this word woman, but to say that. For black people, that category of woman is always already contested. That um, there's ways in which femininity, that whatever that is, doesn't isn't read on black women's bodies, even if we have the requisite sort of like bodily gender, um, uh, sex demarcations of what a uh, female looks like. Um, so yeah, exactly. Black women, short hair, darker skin, and and, and I think the dark skin is the uh, is really the sort of the killer there that um, that that how is that that's that black is seen as masculine. So how do we speak about the experience of 
women who are gendered female that experience and are shaped their life is shaped by that but don't have access to that category female or gender uh, to to sort of express themselves um and so olive becomes it's and she says herself she becomes uh she wants to do something about this um she comes across althea jones Conti who was one of the co-chairs of the very burgeoning uh, UK Black Panther movement, who herself actually was a school teacher that she was already familiar with. And Olive, like many young people in her area, were sort of semi-related to the organization because they went to different events that the UK Black Panther movement were, were doing specifically around uh, curriculum um, and, and education and attainment. Um, Olive uh, agrees to have her injuries photographed and shared in the, the UK Black Panther Movement's um, uh, newspaper that they shared and um, became sort of, sort of like a junior member of the, of the movement. Um, and I think John, in the previous uh, presentation, sort of spoke a lot about sort of the activity that the UK Black Panther Movement um, took place in. Um, that are trying to address the um, so the laws on, on immigration and and racism, specifically the the kind of the sus laws, the way that the police were able to um, use this kind of really amorphous um, discussion of sus uh, suspicion to ostensibly terrorize racialized people, and something that the young people in um, uh, there's a record store we're able to sort of identify immediately that this isn't just about a parking violation. This is about blackness always already being understood as criminal and suspicious. And um, the sus laws arguably are a the most honest articulation of what the black experience is. And I say black. I'm going to use that term sort of like, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to use that term, um, is, is understood in policing. So Olive gets in it and she's a member of the party and she, as the, 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 there is such rich literature already on sort of the ways that this very short moment of time that the UK, like the, the US Black Panther Party, the UK uh, Black Panther movement so it was active for a very short uh, amount of time and the ways in which it was um, uh, hounded by the police and Crown Prosecution Services and the way that the, the law and policing were used to curtail this expression of political dissent or even just political, not even political dissent, when we use that word dissent I think we've already, um, it uh, occludes something which is that um, critiquing race racism in this country oftentimes actually always i'm going to say always is understood as um as an illegitimate move because it uh, and it speaks directly to what this what the uk what britain is um so when we think about uh, a multiculturalism being sort of this um, watered down response to this really deep existential crisis I think that that racialized people bring to this notion of the UK and I think why Olive Morris is such a and so many so many of us do this already but why Olive Morris is so like important in this is because of she's a very at the heart she's a, a remarkable person but she's a remarkable person because of the well what of the her ordinariness of, of her being a person who took her life story her, her life experiences and was able to use it as a as a, a way to um, respond to the kind of issues that she was facing. So as I said, um, she just cons consented consented. <laughs> she she uh, used her her body her injuries as as a, a way to highlight and and address the the ways that the state um, in generally attacked. Uh, black people's not to this kind of um uh, not to this not to make her um not to make this kind of a, a one-off but to say actually this is generalizable that 
yes, I've got the, the, the bruises and things like this, but the kind of disrespect that my body is, is treated with, um, the kind of incident that happened, which was that this started with, which was that ostensibly there's somebody who was contesting an illegal um, sort of uh, um, questioning by the police on the street. And the way that sort of the, the not even, I don't want to use this word like disproportionate um, violence, that the whole incident was not just disproportionate, it was just not fair. And just it should, it, the, the, the idea of law and order is one that doesn't extend often, doesn't extend to um, th this community and their, their response, their fighting back is seen as, as um, illegitimate. Um, Olive faced uh, a number of, of opposition. She's actually involved in a, uh, she was involved in a, a, a court, she was arrested and was involved in a court fine um, with um, Dark as Howe, another member of the UK Black Panther movement, um, over an incident in a, in a community centre in Oval House. Um, Dark as Howe and many other members of the Black Panther movement faced many, many different trials and uh, police harassment and um, threats of legal action for their um, political organising. Um, the Black Panther movement um, disbanded and I'm not going to get too much into the sort of the ins and outs of that because I think although it's very um, telling as well for, for, um, for how Olive's um, political organising sort of uh, went on from there but that this that organization um, was unable to be a container for all the different ways that people were facing uh, state repression and the ways that state repression also mirrored in the interpersonal relationships between members of the party and in sort of general population, I think is, is really telling. So I'll, I'll speak more about that actually in the, maybe in the question and answer if anybody wants to pull that out. But um, Olive uh, created, um, uh, along with her, her friends, Liz Obi and other sort of junior members of the Black Panther movement, um, moved on to uh, establish organizations that were um, more, that actually kind of responded to the issues that they were facing. So um, she, they created the Black, um, Brixton Black Women's uh, Group and uh, which later sort of formed into AWAD, the Organization of Women of Africa and African Descent, and which then again morphed further into the Organization of Women of African and Asian Descent um, to sort of reflect the general political discourse around um, all peoples of, uh, all peoples that are um, immigrant communities in the, in the UK. Um, but that also was a group that disbanded. Um, and they were involved in a lot of political organizing in terms of reading groups, in terms of making direct interventions into um, uh, modes of, of state violence um, around uh, specifically housing rights. So what I think the kind of the image that often gets used of, of Olive and where I sort of want to speak to is her work in the squatters movement so there's this really lovely photograph of olive um climbing up the side of a of a of a house i'll share it with you here um so olive and her her colleagues um, in the Black Panther movement, and then also in um, um, in so the the subsequent groups that she she uh, formed and established were always involved in squatting. Housing was a a huge issue, and it, as as it still is an issue today, um, and specifically for people of racialized communities, um, discrimination against um, immigrant people. Uh, by landlords in charging exorbitant rates in terms of um, uh, properties not being fit for um, properties not being fit for purpose, um, and in particularly in South London, where the housing stock had been 
sort of radically reduced because of the sort of after the Second World War, Brixton, um, Brixton and South London was heavily bombed in the Second World War. There was very little rebuilding of those properties. Um, and arguably, one could say, I, I make this argument in other places that um, this was one of the reasons why Brixton and Clapham and those kind of areas became hubs for sort of the Windrush generation because these boroughs who had faced depopulation because of, again, the sort of the growth of the suburbs, changes in the economic environment, but also just the, the lack of quality housing stock required new people to sort of embolse the economy. And so um, the story goes that the sort of the wind rush that comes into docks into Brixton, so docks into um, docks in and people are taken to Clapham to an ex um, army base and sort of a so-called acclimatized to the UK and the job exchange is in, in Lambeth in uh, Brixton. And so that's why this kind of this tunnel between these two places, sort of the original place that people are brought into and um, where the job exchange is, but also that the mayor of, of Lambeth really encouraged those people um, to stay. And yes, this was sort of a, a progressive move, which to say that um, England accepts all its, its colonial um, subjects or all, all, all to Mother England, but also in the form of global capital for the, the precise reason why those people were uh, sort of invited, encouraged to come to the UK in the first place was that um, labour was needed, um, but also that the, they they themselves in their bodies, um, as to increase that population, able to the that bar Lambeth bar were able to make more demands on central government because it has requisite numbers to to make those demands. But then how those resources, state resources, then allocated. Um, raciality, you can say, is that kind of road of race means that people, um, it's not the labour that, that's needed, it's they themselves and their bodies that have value, but that value isn't one of, um, um, it's a value that isn't, isn't that you, you are valuable itself, but rather you, you show that you're not like you're 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 valuable enough to be to be uh, to the state to make claims on your behalf, but not valuable enough to then be able to be a citizen and be able to operate and have all the privileges of the state. And if we think about capital in that way, that there are people whose relationship isn't that of um, isn't that of labour. You're not alienated because your labour is devalued. You're alienated because you and your body are devalued. And this is something I think that feminist discourses try to get to and say well actually global patriarchy really is the issue what people gendered female and racialized but particularly black female women are that the it's not that we're not allowed to enter into the workplace it's not that global patriarchy has a story about us that means that we're incapable of being workers it's that that we are workers there's never not that that us entering into the workforce isn't that, that case that we are gendered female and yet don't have any of the sort of the, so, and I will say like privileges of femininity in terms of uh, protection by the state, in terms of having our bodily integrity um, uh, seen as something that the state can intervene on our behalf. If anything, the state will violate our bodily integrity, um, like what happened in the police station with Olive. Um, so as I said that, housing was a huge issue and um the way that um people so many people not just um in the in the caribbean communities but actually so many different communities um who saw that there was this huge amount of housing stock that it wasn't huge amount of housing stock that wasn't habitable that landlords were forcing people to pay rent on properties that weren't ha uh, habitable that the state which claimed that there was going to be sort of access to universal housing and housing lists with being very discriminatory towards um, those communities and not being able to house them. So, well, look, if you're going to make us live in rubbish houses, like I, we might as well house ourselves and not pay rent and use and, and, uh, you know, sorry, um, and address those. So, I, there's a really another really wonderful image 
um, of Olive uh, uh, sort of responding, sorry, um, responding to a landlord who objected to um, their, their sort of like reclaiming of, of property. Um, uh, there. And so the, this is basically the, the, the squatters movement. So the squatters handbook that I showed you earlier was a resource that was shared um, to sort of teach people how you can circumvent the law in order to find property and, and face and sort of uh, take into your hands the housing insecurity that is kind of structurally written that um, rather than accept that, okay, so the state doesn't recognize immigrants as having the same rights as white people do. Um, that, and, and to be honest, like even, um, and that you sort of debarred from the other mechanisms that sort of working class white people are able to have access to, like um, getting loans for a mortgage or tapping into existing family networks that were able to house you or kind of benevolence funds um, that are rooted in, um, sort of relationships with um, non-state entities like the church or mutual groups that are a stem from your community when those mutual groups um, didn't recognize um, black people as being a constituent that that needed that could be um, supported by them um, not all but this is a, a lot of them so this is kind of an alternative way of organizing um, and one that oftentimes doesn't get to be seen as political as such. Um, black women sort of leaving home, recognizing that oftentimes the family unit is not a place of safety, um, that the kind of oftentimes responses to women going in, single women going to housing offices asking for um, to be home housed by themselves is that why don't you just stay with your family? Um, or the kind of um, disrespect or it's kind of seen that there's a community of women, especially women who uh, find themselves um, with families, with children and without a partner, um, are seen as being actually not only people that sh uh, shouldn't be housed or are morally um, responsible for their own housing insecurity, but also that they are a reason, they're a cause for everybody else's lack of housing if there wasn't so many single mothers if there weren't so many immigrants if there weren't so many single women then we wouldn't have the um, housing crisis that we have not that there has been a pause on house rebuilding that there was there oftentimes were properties available but they weren't being allocated to these groups so um it, and also that um your personal choices like the idea of that as, as autonomous beings that you don't have the rights to how you can um, organize your life. Um, the, the, the Black Women's Group that um, Olive Morris and Liz Obi and Bella Dadzi and um, Susan Scarf and sort of the, the other uh, women that came out of the Black Panther movement um, created work speaking to those things. How do we address state violence and also recognize that there are ways that uh, Black women are oppressed within our homes? How do we speak to um, anti-capitalism, um, but know that also the things that are happening to us are also within global capital? Um, Stella, and, and that's why I think it's really important that we think about sort of the, um, the terms that we, we use when we're talking about sort of like solidarity and sort of anti-imperialist and anti-racist conversations. Um, Olive Morris is from Jamaica, and the person of African descent. Um, the colonial has always included slavery. Global capital, arguably the first global commodity, you can say really is a global commodity of people, and people of African descent, who from, um, and that when we think about colonialism and imperialism, oftentimes this is kind of shaped by land. And we can think of uh, Jamaica as a place of just as a, as a space of land where commodities are extracted from and go in to feed um, the sort of imperial systems in, in Europe. Or we can also, but to think about labor in that purest form, um, 
really negates all the different ways that um, slavery actually structures how we understand subjectivity, how it is that we are as we are in our, in our bodies and how we are as political agents. And so words like consent and um, individuality and family and all these types of things are actually, when we think about um, enslaved peoples, what do those words do? What do those words mean? Um, black feminist scholarship in the, I'm going to say black, black, black feminist scholarship in the UK, as well as in the US, have always have, have a tradition, many have a tradition of thinking about global capital, not from this concept of the commodity fetish as such, but understanding that there is a way in which in our bodily forms, that, that is a commodity, that uh, black, that for black peoples, it is not our labor relation that is exploited, but in and of our bodies. And, we, um, and that has multiple uh, uses. Um, black Women, the Heart of the Race, the first chapter of this book speaks about the relationship of Britain from, from the standpoint of slavery and how, um, and um, we spoke about earlier about uh, Angela Davis. Angela Davis has uh, so much work and so much of the sort of political activism of the Black Panther movement was to make this explicit case that there is a continuum between um, slavery uh, and the treatment of black peoples today. So thinking about slavery, not as a historical event by which there was emancipation and things like this, or even just an analogy to say, oh, we are now wage slaves, that we can use slavery as this kind of catch-all amorphous term to, um, to uh, describe any type of hyper-exploitation and things like that. But rather, actually, slavery is um, a constituent part of what we now understand as capital, that it has um, a, a culture, that it has a, um, uh, an understanding behind it that we can see everywhere. We can see in the way that women of African descent, their bodies are uh, not given the type of, um, uh, are not given the same sort of uh, understanding to be outside of work or not being capable of, of, of labor, the way that people of other racialized communities face, that the, um, the, the kind of the, I, 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 yeah, that um, I want to be careful about the way that I use language because I don't want to rarefy um, these types of um, uh, descriptions, but to say that they are nonetheless a reality and that the way that uh, black feminist organizing, there are black, black feminist organizers kind of address these, these things. Um, and housing as well is, is as another form of, of, of where this, this kind of operates from, that um, if we think about housing as being just about who gets to live where, and think about um, why, the, the why behind this, why have people come to the UK? Why have um, uh, women had to, uh, women continually face housing insecurity? The kind of circumstances behind those, those things and the type of, um, and then that kind of shapes hopefully kind of political organizing that takes place um, that that hopefully that can even recognize the political behind the type of organizing that takes place. Um, Olive uh, was involved in the squatters movement and to recognize as well the squatters movement wasn't only something that people of uh, afro caribbean descent were involved in. There were white squatters movements, there were gay rights squatters movements, um, but th then there was, um, I don't use segregation, but these things were happening in silos because people recognized that the kind of conflicts that were the kind of reasonings behind how people came to houselessness, homelessness, were different in different operations. Um, and um, so whereas one person would be removed from the family, sort of for white, I don't want to generalize, but oftentimes when, for example, the gay, uh, gay swatters movement and i use gay and i, I i'm not talking about um yeah thank you um and say so that not to say that uh yeah that the the right that the squatters movement had um sort of lots of different arms to it but exactly because there were different types different ways that people were um 
came to houselessness and how, how they were able to um, have the state respond as well. Um, so we've got 10 minutes left and I've massively overrun. So I'm going to zoom through um, some sort of key developments, in my opinion, of um, kind of why Olive Morris is such an important organiser um, and a sort of political figure. And hopefully then we can have some presentation, uh, some question and answers um, after that. Um, so let me continue to square share screen. Um, Okay. So, as I said, Olive was born. In, um, so she was involved in activity, activism, um, in sort of police brutality. Um, Olive was involved in um, in a lot of uh, internationalist uh, solidarity movements. She travelled to China. She travelled to. Um, she attempted to travel to uh, North Africa to visit Elder Kiva when he was in exile in Algeria to speak to Elder Kiva, one of the member of the one of the founding members of the U.S. Uh, Black Panther movement. Um, she wrote about her travels, wrote about anti-imperialist, anti-capitalist struggles across the world. Um, she uh, studies after, after. Unfortunately, when she left school, she was any. Uh, she didn't receive any A levels or O levels, but she. Um, I'm, I'm going to keep with this. Um, this article, sorry. Um, she, but she returned to university and went to University of Manchester, where she set up mutual aid groups and uh, also a similar group as Black Brixton as Black um, Manchester Black Women um, Group. The this is a pay, this is a newspaper from the Organization of Women of uh, Asian and African Descent. It's kind of examples of the kind of issues that uh, these women were organizing around. Um, looking at the way that uh, children from racialized communities were impacted by the care system and were taken away from their families and also the kind of abuse that was taking place um, to those children um, as wards of the state. And so I'm uh, really addressing the um, kind of common sense discourse around children in care and the kind of pipelines between children, children going into care and going into criminality, whether it be uh, having to work as sex workers or um, uh, other um, sort of uh, things that are deemed criminal, such as uh, burglary or kind of gangs and things like this, and really turn this picture back on the state to say that this is what how you value children from our communities. That actually that this is um, how the state is able to discipline. Um, racialized families with the threat of taking children into care when we when the way that we raise our children do not conform with the very limited constricted views that you understand family rearing to be but also how they are uh, disproportionately uh, meted against racialized communities so even these standards of care that are claimed to be universal are not universally applied to and this kind of argument is exactly the, uh, is a continuation of the kind of political analysis that was formed through the squatters movement and the housing rights movement and um, so, but um, OWAD as an organization uh, had a very short run and disbanded and many of the reasons why it disbanded was kind of in the, in the other presentations, but the ways that um, it was understood that it was unable to uh, meet sort of a unifying claim, a unifying demand of all the, um, um, all the sort of the uh, demand of all the different groups that were inside of it. Or OAD had people who were involved in anti-colonial, still continuing anti-colonial struggles, and, uh, and uh, such as sort of um, the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa, still very active. Um, uh, women who were involved in um, sort of the, the fight for independence in Ethiopia, um, communities in Ethiopia and Eritrea. Um, and this kind of, these, the kind of demands of these groups, as well as people of uh, Caribbean descent wanting to um, uh, have more cultural discourses about what does it mean to be a Caribbean person, to be a Jamaican person, to be a Trinidadian person. And um, sort of these kind of conflict, 
this, uh, these different types of um, demands that people want to have to kind of just explore internal um, uh, identities, how they people understand themselves. It's been claimed that sort of disrupted, dis distracted from making greater critiques of the state. Um, another claim that's been made is that um, the general sort of oppression of black people, such as the kind of issues that were happening post um, Brixton riots of 81 and then 85 and so on, were also uh, very sort of distracting to these uh, female autonomous groups because they were trying to address how sort of the mass imprisonment and um, sort of the, the difference sort of various trials and things like that that were taking place in the in communities in general that they belong belong to not just sort of issues that were considered only um issues that faced women why i think olive morris is amazing and why i think more people need to talk about her life and how this is a very strange place that we're in right now where olive morris's her, her stories become more um has become more famous um but her writings the kind of deep critiques that she had of specifically leftist organizing um, she uh, sort of wrote sort of position paper on the way that sort of anti-fascist, anti-Nazi groups um, utilized uh, discrimination against black peoples without actually going into the ins and outs of what are the terms by which those communities understood their crit uh, issues with um, fascism and Nazism. And, and I think that this is a kind of approach of anti-racist organizing where people think about, they think they know what race is, that race is this kind of really big issue, this big thing that we think we know when we see it, but perhaps the mechanisms behind of what, how race operates is not um, articulated um, as clearly. And so earlier I spoke about colonialism and slavery and those two things seen as separate. Um, but if you're from the West Indies, from the Caribbean, then you know that that's not the case, that uh, and the kind of the, the way that uh, anti-racist uh, anti or um, uh, struggles of uh, black communities in US absolutely appreciate and know and have a very uh, um, a dynamic critique of capital that is able to include uh, enslaved peoples. We've, um, I'm just going to now be polemical and say that there's been this, in this attempt of um, unity and this attempt of being able to show uh, so verify the subject position of immigrant, we occlude what the world that slavery created in the words of Professor Sidia Hartman, the afterlife of slavery and how it continues to shape what we understand as the political and therefore what are legitimate means by which, even this word legitimate, proper means by what we think as anti-political, um, uh, sorry, no, um, as, as political foment, like organizing around state-based state violence, rather than thinking about violence in total. Um, Rare of understanding um, political identities as either being um, obstructive to movement or um, otherwise kind of this really sort of coarse, weak way of um, organizing that says we all have all our individual just kind of multicultural discourses that say oh, we all need to be these kind of individuals and just kind of everybody's uh, identity is is valid and we're not going to critique how some people come into political spaces and how uh, racism operates in different ways against different bodies and the, the kind of body politic. Olive Morris very effortlessly, and I say not eff I do know that's, that's not fair, to say that she was somebody who, because her organizing came from her life experience and her bodily work and the very specific history that she is, she embodies the, the huge array of areas that she was involved in and the kind of the really innovative ways that that kind of uh, that view of the political is made, I think is reflective of um, the very uh, the very ways that people gendered as female and uh, people of um, African descent, but specifically those who are from the as the Professor C D Hartman would say that absolutely not C D Hartman. I think this is this is this is Sylvia Wins, this is a fellow Jamaican press. Uh, uh, Sylvie Winter says, ex-slave Caribbean, it holds a mirror to Britain and not just say you were here, we're here because you were there, but also we made you. That um, what you understand as, as class, it was only ever available, not just because of the um, taking away of the commons, but also because of this new 
um, uh, modes of of not not just I, I want to take away these kind of temporalities of new or old, but to say that there's a power dynamic that that institutes, and that when those um, peoples are then coming to the metropole, it changes what the metropole is. Um, so yeah, I'm just I'll just come out here to spitballing, just come out all that stuff. Um, I think we've run out of time. So if yeah, people find me, we'll talk about this more. Um, I have like a paper on this, so we'll just you can read that. Thank you all for your time. And um, yeah, no, we hopefully can sort of continue this conversation more. And um, yeah, and just actually want to say a final point about just the ethics of, of of taking people's biography and story and thinking about sort of narrative on that. Um, I uh, I think history in and of itself is that as a framework is problematic. The idea that we can really accurately know what happened in the past, but also that they even want to, that there are issues that we face now and here, and I take everything as a resource to help me towards what that is. Um, that can be claimed as being ahistorical, and therefore something that's uh, not in good scholarship. Um, I contest and say that history has never been my friend anyway, and that as black peoples, if we, um, the reason why I, I, did, I, I do the work that I do is to say that my story for myself isn't constricted to um, the official narrative of history, and equally, um, to, uh, creating an alternative history is not really gonna do it either. And maybe that we just like, um, the task at hand, is to um, contest what history is in its first place and release us from its bounds. And that's me vibing off Fanon. So yeah, anyway, thank you everyone. You're awesome. I think we're going into the next room <laughs> now. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. That's great. Um, I think once you're done, if you just click leave room and then we'll head back into the main room and see what happens there. Thank you so much, Ada. that was amazing. Oh, you're, bless you, very generous. <laughs>